Yes, hello folks, welcome to the weekly Manchester United podcast on this Monday afternoon here in, in um, California and you're in where? You're in Colorado, aren't you, James? Yeah, yeah, just around Denver. It's around Denver, you're an hour ahead of me, aren't you? So was it one or two hours ahead of me? You, you, just an hour, okay. just an hour, an mountain hour. time, one of the few places you'll ever meet somebody in Maryland. Congratulations, you wish you were about 12 months ahead of me, so you didn't have to go through everything with United or about to go through, at least a week, <laughs> about two weeks ahead of me, so you didn't have to go through what this going to happen this weekend of course this is uh another monday episode of the weekly match United show um as usual just like last week um could have been a happy week ended up being a depressing yep. week um have we recorded this podcast on thursday we'd have been in the same place we were in after everton yep. we're thinking good result good performance something to build on and then of course they go out and do what they did last weekend against Newcastle and this weekend against Bournemouth and repeated what was an absolutely disgraceful performance. We'll talk about that, man. We'll talk about a few other things. Um, as you know, and as everyone else that listens to this podcast knows, I've been a, a big defender of Ten Hag. Um, I know he's not perfect. I know there's certain parts of him that he deserves legitimate criticism. Um, but this was the first week I got I was really angry at him. And I don't want to be negative, but when I saw that team, I was angry. And I thought to myself, how does Anthony Martial make it on a football pitch for Manchester United after what he did at Newcastle? I mean, what he did at Newcastle should be career death sentence at any top football club. We never should be allowed on the pitch again. Because I'm not asking, I, I understand when you're a Manchester United striker, central striker, the service is atrocious, we'll get into that. So, okay, if you don't score, but walking through games, half-paced jog through games, no no, no intensity in the press, no real desire to get the ball, um, same pace, that is an absolute disgrace that you're on the pit for Manchester United. And Ten Hag, I'm sorry, but you deserve everything. I mean, the fact that he was hooked in 55 minutes was entirely predictable because I knew that before he went on the field. Dojo Dallo is another one that should not be on a pitch for Manchester United. I'm trying to understand how Wan-Bissaka isn't being picked. And Diojo Dallo concedes the same goal every single week for exactly the same reason. The second goal that United conceded, James Nankin, watch Dallo. Watch how yep. he doesn't press the ball. He stands off his player, gets him, lets him take time, lifts, lifts his head, lets him put the cross in. And then, of course, there's weak defender in the box. Against Chelsea, he almost conceded. Uh, uh, Bro had the back post. Same goal he's conceded against Galatasaray. Same goal he conceded against Copenhagen. The same goal it was conceded against Newcastle. Although it was one Bissaka in that season from falling asleep with the ball and not watching what's coming over their shoulder. Um, and the other thing that infuriated me about Dallo was when he had that shot instead of crossing it to yep. Holland. Lastly, yep. I want you to. I don't know if you've done this yet, but take a look at the United players after they concede. And take a look at the body language. And I know we, we say this a lot, but they look like players that just conceded in a five side. They just I mean, the 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 the, the um, sheer indifference, you know, it's like hands in the air, turn around, walk the halfway line. All right, this that what they did at the weekend is an absolute disgrace. Yeah, and it is frustrating because a lot of the problems you can see are essentially of their own making at this point in time. There's a, there's a lot of things that can be done about a lot of the issues that are occurring. You know, that second goal, I remember, because I, I also highlighted that. I was talking to somebody and, and looked at it and said, you know, you've got, you've got I think it was Billings, right, who scores, who's, mm -hmm. what, six foot five, six foot six? And you've got Shaw at center back, who's not very tall, not a big guy. Um Billings is free running into the box and instead of pressing, instead of closing down the cross, mm -hmm. there's no way that Luke Shaw is going to beat him to that ball. I don't care how close he is to him, how tight he is to him. There's no way he's beating him to it. Player running at momentum into pace in there. And these are problems of your own making these types of things. I mean, it's just kind of across the pitch and, and, uh, and the team selections become baffling because there's very little consistency. And I think that that would be, and I mean, when I say consistency, I mean consistency in why players are being dropped and why players are being yeah. uh, no, uh, selected. And, um, 
you know, I understand why. Let's 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 look at it this way. In terms of um, every manager has the right to choose on certain things, but you do live and die by those things. Unfortunately, that that's just how it is. What you have available. Um, you know, we've been playing. For example, I think the three major areas that stand out to me that continue to be a problem, going back to that second goal, with selecting Luke Shaw as a left-footed center back, mm -hmm. and then we don't play out the back. We just go long anyway. What's the point? So he loses. We lose on set pieces. We lose on crosses. Two balls into the box, where you have a much um, more effective player at defending those in Rafa Varane sitting on the bench mostly down to the reason being given of a uh, footedness and passing. But even that second goal came off Luke Shaw making a mistake, passing out the back. Um, he was up advanced in a left back kind of position, passed the ball into the middle of pass. He probably makes dozens of times as a left back um, and can get back in position. But as a center back, a lot more dangerous. The first goal, I think, came off of a clearance into the middle. And there's a few like that. That's a problem of its own making. Wambasaka, I think, was one of the keys to last season being successful uh, in the way that it was. He really grew into it in the second half of the season, uh, really took hold of the position. I think when he plays, yeah, there's the instance where you'll see him fall asleep. But the rest of the game, he tends to be very aggressive, very challenging, not allowing the ball into the area. And um, we've seen, I think, almost a goal per game come through Diogo Dallo's position um, through the last couple of months. And uh, and then there's the factor of this, this whole goal-scoring situation. I understand why Marcus Rashford was dropped. I understand that. It makes sense to me. I don't understand why Tony Martial plays. You know, if, if you're going to have a game off, we don't even play the way that it would work for, for Anthony Martial to play, you know. Uh, Anthony's not going to run There's ahead no of him. There's no way work for Anthony Martial. I, I just don't see it. It, it makes no There's sense. no way it would work for him at all. The guy, the guy is not be on a professional football pitch. Yeah, it's been what? It's been three years, right, since he's played in 90 minutes. Um, I don't see it. I don't get it. And, and um you know, and, and, and obviously then there's this whole issue with the midfield of, of playing Scott McTominay for the goals. And I get it. I understand why you want to play him when you have uh, not a lot of options right now in terms of um, personnel, of course. Um, but the, the way that he's been essentially utilized, I mean, for years, Scott McTominay was utilized as a deep defender in a two. That actually was quite successful in terms of shoring up the defense. The way he's playing now is a position that I don't think exists in the Premier League which is sort of this almost essentially a second striker. The midfield tends to be totally vacated. And, and it's not even to pick on McTominay too much because there's things he's good at and there's things he's not. And he's obviously following and, and attending to instruction. But against Chelsea, there were three or four chances on the break. Against Galatasaray, there were three or four chances on the break. Against Bournemouth, the, the, the manager said it himself. We know they're going to be open in transition, and we're going to we're going to get them there, and that's where we scored our goals. Everybody knows it. It's the worst kept secret in England that Manchester United. You just hit them on the transition. You just wait for them to send all these men forward for McTominay to run in the box, for Bruno to get in the box, for the strikers and everybody to be all around the front, and then you just run in behind them, and they can't do anything about it. And um, it's these are structural problems that are really poor that I don't know how you resolve. And and the one of the issues is that a lot of times the points table can be confusing um, and it can really throw things off a bit. One of, one of the greatest problems I think we've had with Ten Hag is that there's too much been too much pressure since he started, since the first season, to get points instead of to play and to, to put in, you know, the way that he wants to play. I don't understand and agree with, you know, you have to win games, you can't keep losing or, um things happen but when you look at a lot of the the numbers united when they weren't winning points were probably playing better just not scoring not scoring goals um now they're picking up points and then not picking up points and falling out of the champions league while somewhat scoring more goals and it's a it's a 
tricky problem, but you know, there's, I don't have the, the answer. Obviously you got a lot of players coming back from injury, which hopefully will help. But when you're making the choices that are being made, I think you live with that. that Here's uh, the thing. I've spoke to professional footballers about this and I've asked, what's the biggest difference between a championship player and a top Premier League player? Uh, the answer is always the same, consistency. Mm -hmm. So there are some amazing players at Champions League level, League One player, League Two level, that are technically superb, brilliant players, but they aren't consistent. And to be consistent in life, you have to be consistent in the play you apply your standards off the pitch. It doesn't matter what position you're in, doesn't matter what job you're in. If you are consistent, it's because you are consistently doing the right things. I remember Ferguson said about Leeds when they would play United and they give a hundred percent and they desperately try to win the game and then they go out next week against Charlton and lose when they're cheating their manager. Yeah. The players that are picking and choosing games we, we see this in the fa cup every year teams can get up for a game and there was a couple of things that were said after that game that were really alarming to me one of them was from bruno fernandez where he said that we thought this would be easy after what happened against chelsea this is to me an underlying uh indicator of one of the major problems that united is that to me they're always trying to do the bare minimum Right. They, so instead of coming out with the attitude that we're going to come out here flam, we're desperate to win, we're going to give every last drop of effort, we're going to you know prepare properly. It's about how can we do the bare minimum to win this game, right? Because I don't want to do all that other stuff. You know, we two two good performances in a week. No, 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 no. We've already given you one. We've already felt like after the Chelsea game that we answered every critic that came before us. That you know now we can go out and take a foot off a paddle and go back to normal and not doing shit. And just, you know, lackadaisical attitude. You saw it the first minute with Shaw's back pass to Onana. Almost gets caught. Bruno Fernandes with a totally ridiculous ball from left back into midfield. And then the the the, the response to that, um, it was atrocious. There was no uh, intensity. It was just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's the way it goes. Who cares? Right? And to me, when you have inconsistency like that, that's a reflection. I'm not exonerating Ten Hag. Ten Hag has his own issues, right? But um, when you have a situation where you're forward line, you, your central striker, one, hasn't commit, been able to complete 90 minutes in three years. Two, yeah. your other central strikers completed 90 minutes four times this season. Right? Can't play three in a row. Right? Yeah. Your right winger hasn't scored in over a year or an assist, which is just, just a total disgrace. Not me. Um, it's been a year since he scored in the Premier League. Um, you have um, Marcus Rashford that scored one goal all season. Had you have told me at the start of the season we would be sitting in December where our forward line has one goal between Martial, Rashford, two goals, Martial's goal at Everton. Mar you know, obviously, Garnaccio's got his goal, but between Martial, Rashford and Hoyland, we'd be sitting on two goals. And I would I would have found that hard to believe. I would have said, well, one of them must have been out, two of them must have been out for a long time, must be a long injury. There's no way they'll have played that many games in that score. And I know that a big part of this, and this is where I feel Ten Hag has to take responsibility, is that if you play centrally, if you needed, you get no service. I mean, mm -hmm. the service. Watch, watch the Spurs game. Son creates two goals, beating his player, knocking the ball straight across the box. So Doji scores, lovely ball straight across the yeah. box. Right. That at United would have ended up in a shot wide, or you know, someone dribbling down the line, holding on to it too long. Or what you saw with Doji with that. How many times have we seen Roy Hoyland? frustrated in the center, you know, visible frustration from not getting simple square balls yep. that you would get from your wide players, put the ball across the box, right? Yep. That's what you have a central striker for. And the way that team is playing, um, and I think this is where Ten Hag really has to take responsibility is, you know, McTominay's up there because the goals aren't coming from anywhere else. Why can't you get a team to play in a certain way that plays to the strengths of your central striker. And if your wingers yeah. can't do that, if your midfielders can't do that, you have a big problem. Okay. Yep. One of those wingers you bought in Anthony. And honestly, if I'm playing, if I'm a goalkeeper against Anthony and I see him get the ball, I'm just going to walk over to the far right hand post. I'm just going to sit there and wait for the ball because you know that he's exactly. coming into yep. the far post. I mean, there, there, there was at one point uh, Nato, well, Anthony cuts inside, shoots. 
and that was just the handling of Sigu strikes because you never put it anywhere else. You <laughs> never put it anywhere else. It, it, the same move, cut inside, shoot, far post, cut inside, shoot. I mean, you, ha you have to have more than something about you than that. There's got to be something that goes in the far post. you got to swing the right foot. you got to put something down. The there has to be more to it than that. And yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, there's a couple of things. I think you'll find this terribly funny statistic that, uh, like you were talking about here, you know the last winger, the last forward to score at Old Trafford for United was? Um, you mean Central Strager? No, no, no. The last forward to score at home at Old Trafford for United of any of the no. forwards. No, it was Jaden Sancho last year in May. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, well, 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 I'm not counting Rashford as a forward, but um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. how bad it's been. That's how bad it's been. And, um, you know... It, you, what you're saying about consistency and doing the whole job is, I think, a big part of it. Because if you look at United and their inconsistencies and the players, a lot of them get let off the hook very often because yeah. Yeah. they do something well. Mm -hmm. So Anthony gets praised for the last few games because he defends well. But he's a right winger. He can go play fullback if he wants to defend well. But he doesn't score, and it's been a year since he scored a goal. Um, you know... Uh, you get the same thing across the board. You get the same thing for Luke Shaw, who gets credit for his passing and his progression, but the mistakes he makes defensively, things like that, that are pretty regular, he gets off the off the hook for. Um, you know, and I like Luke Shaw a lot, but every single player, you'll say, well, they're good at something. You know, uh, they're good at something, and they do one thing pretty well. So McTominay comes in and he's scoring goals, but then doesn't do the rest of the, the game at all. Doesn't do anything in the rest of the game. Bruno Fernandes will pick when he does it and puts a lot of effort in most of the time. But it's always one thing that they can do instead of being an all-around player for the position and doing all of what is necessary. And uh, and it's true. I'm think I was just thinking about that as as you're saying that, you know, that is probably you could pick that with every single player. And um, when they're doing something extremely valuable, like when Marcus Rashford is scoring 30 goals, you can get away with it. When you're not, we see what happens this season with every player doing something that you could say they're good at, but not everything. And it can't be enough just to be a good presser. And it can't be enough just to be, you know, um, someone who attacks and gets shots and, and passes. It, you gotta, they really do have to want to want to do the entire job and uh, and I don't think that uh, that is part of the attitude. And I understand there's roles and things like that, but I think that is a criticism you could level at every single United player is that um, there's maybe half the game that they're good at and the other half they just let slip. Listen and, this, uh, and I owe this to Kyle Anker from <clears throat> the Fantastic Talk of the Devils podcast, so credit where it's due. Um, every single season since Ferguson, where United have finished on 70-plus points, Qualify for the Champions League. The following season, they finished sixth. Hmm. Whether in sixth, right? Now, right, doing yeah. exactly the same thing they're doing right now. You know, no attitude, atrocious. You know, yeah. uh, no style of play. No, no desire. You know, nobody functioning. See a lot of the same players sulking. A lot of the same everything. It, and, and again, I'm not saying that to um, to exonerate Ten Hag because I do think there's certain parts where. It, 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 you know, when you do what happened, what happened against Bournemouth, when that happens, you have to take criticism. I'm sorry, and the fact that they can't create chances for the front line is just, you know, I mean, it's no surprise. Weghorst never scored either in the Premier League. Um, you know, okay, he's not a top striker, but I could you at the weekend not. I mean, I know Rashford was really poor against Newcastle, but so was so was Martial. How could yeah. you not? Rashford down the middle. Martial has no intention of ever getting to the peak of the, the guy had talent, no doubt about it. Yeah. Right? He's almost yeah. 13 years now, which is unbelievable. Now, you need to have an option to extend this contract by a year. Mm. Andy Martial gets a contract extension at Manchester United, burn the football club to the ground. There isn't a more clear case of there's absolutely no way. This is the answer. I mean, Joe Hugo, when Rashford got his chance against Midland, weirdly enough, after Martial was injured in the warm-up, 
Um, he got a chance, he took it. You cannot tell me that Joe Hugo wouldn't have come in and given United something a little more than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I I don't want to dislike a Manchester United player because I, you know, I, I, I've had moments where I've been angry at United players. But my contempt and anger for a guy who doesn't want to break out of a jog. I mean, just take a look at how many times the ball will come across the box. He wasn't making an effort to run across strikers. He wasn't, or defenders, you know, just no hunger really to get the ball. I'm going, yep. at this point, I blame you, Ten Hag, for, for, for allowing that. I'm sorry. And, and he's not alone, James, because I don't want to single him out because yep. there's more, to, there's a lot more than that. But that to me is unforgivable. And I think that fine if you don't play well, fine if you don't score goals, but to jog three games, I mean, it's just impossible. You, they just pass around them every single time. There's no pressure on the defenders. There's no, you know, it just it just looks like you call them be arsed, you know? And um, I, I don't know how this is allowed. And the fact that United don't have a striker that can play three games in a week or 90 minutes is just defies belief to me. I mean, it's a, it, it is an illustration of just how disgraceful things have been run at that football club for years. It makes me really angry. Yeah, and I know that, you know, I, I think it was taken a little bit out of context, to be honest, the the quotes that came or, or the, yeah, uh, no, the no, article. Because no. at first it was like, what is this? And then you look at the quotes and it was a little different because it was yeah, more like they, had no idea with that. they knew what they were doing they knew that yeah. they were could be in a bit with that <laughs> yeah because it was saying we're going to decide on the four players and, and the way it was presented was they're look they're working on extending them but that's not the same thing working on making a decision is different and and i think that outside of one beside i think um hannibal mejbury will probably get extended because mm -hmm. he's a young player with value um, I think all of that's pretty much on hold at the moment anyway. So it's sort of a pointless point, but I think Hannibal Mejbury will get extended. He's a young player at worst. He can go out on loan. He's going to be a professional footballer somewhere. So he's got value that's worth preserving. They paid yeah. 10 million for him. Uh, Juan Bisaka, I think, you know, there's an article that uh, it's sort of stalled at the moment, but I think there's a few reasons for that. I think if you're Wambasaka, you do want to understand your role, why you're not playing again, things like that. That might be part of it moving forward. Um, but I think all contracts are pretty much on hold at the moment. Mm -hmm. But Victor Lindelof and Anthony Martial, there's no reason to me that they should be extended under any circumstances. Um, you have Harry Maguire, Rafael Varane, and Lissandra Martinez is your center backs. I know they're looking at center backs for both sides, right? Center backs, left center backs. You have all the names that have come up over the over time. Toribo, they've looked at players like Ignacio, Brainthwaite from Everton. I don't see any reason why Victor Lindelof's contract should be extended. Um, he hasn't been good enough. You've been buying center backs every single year. And there's no reason to keep him. Now, I don't think he will be. I think that come summer, it's more likely that Lindelof and at least one of Maguire and Varane will go, depending on changes, depending on manager, depending on a few things. And two center backs will be brought in. But that is one of the things I hope will change significantly under essentially new management of the club is uh, just let him go. You know, let them go and get new players in, get top players in. You know, you don't know what's going to happen with Lissandra Martinez's injury and how he returns from that and all of that. I get that. He'll be back soon, a couple of weeks, sounds like. But buy competition. Buy someone who's good enough to compete with him so that we don't have this situation again if something does go wrong. Um, be forward thinking. And I think that that is uh, what, one of the major things that I hope. I think... Contracts are a big sign of how United have operated and how they've ended up in this position. We've seen it time and time again. Anthony Martial shouldn't have gotten the last contract he got. And he's still here. I mean, yeah. Wamba Sacco gets his contract extended for me before Dallow. Yeah, right? I would agree. And yeah. I mean, at least Wamba Sacco is good at something. Yeah. I, I yep. mean, you stand one second. You want to shut down a winger? You you can use him to do that job, like that specific role, and he will do it. 
it would yeah. do it well. Like, um, you know, when he, when they took him off against Galatasaray, you could see that Zaha was like, was ecstatic, you know, all of a sudden, yeah. you know, I, I'm confident, but, um, you know, I would, I would be okay with him keeping Wambasaki. He's limited going forward. You know, to me, Lendl Law, if you get rid of Maguire, um, or if you get rid of Varane, I'm okay with him being a backup centre back because he was fine in my opinion as a backup centre back last season when United needed him on the right hand side. Um, but he can't be start a part of the starting centre back pairing. It's very yeah. difficult to get decent centre backs beyond the first two that are willing to do third choice centre back, fourth choice centre back. Um, because most players that are good enough won't do that. Um so you know, I, I wouldn't be devastated if he left, but um, I, I also not totally against him being a backup centre back. Um, but obviously, you know, they'd need much better quality in that. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, you were mentioned about McTominay who played deep. Part of the problem when you play McTominay deep is the transitions in the midfield. Is that he's yeah. not really good enough technically with his back. Yeah. To, to to midfield yep. to be able to like you see with Manu who is very he's very aware of his space he's very aware of what's around him he's technically yep. good enough to get out of tight holes on the half turn um and he's very aware of what's behind him I mean if you look at that ball from Fernandez McCamney was weak in that first in, mm-hmm. in, in one with yeah he didn't try it should be cutting yep. that off because if you look at where the danger is going to come from you should know that this is not where you want to give the ball away. So get yep. my body between the ball and the player. Yep. And then my time I just kind of threw a lazy leg out and, you know, want to take the ball. But this is, to me, a big part of the problem with playing him deeper. He started scoring goals for Scotland. And it obviously needed goals. When they were talking about getting rid of him, my thought was, well, he gives you something on set pieces. I think if you're behind in a game, you want to bring him on for the last 15, 20 minutes, fine. Okay? Yeah. But... The problem for McTominay is, and we said this on last week's podcast, you have to play him in that mount position where you play him really high, but then, of course, that leaves you so wide open in midfield. And Ten Hag has, in my opinion, Ten Hag United's midfield gets dominated every single week, no matter who they play. And, um, you know, teams look at that midfield and say, this is where we can get at them. Um, You know, they don't score a lot of goals from open play. So, you don't really have to worry about, you know, them cutting you open through the middle. Um, and so if you look at how they're scoring goals, I mean, they did score two goals from open play against Chelsea, but for the most part, you know, they're talking about a piece of magic somewhere, you know, a yeah. somewhere, but it's not really fluid play that's cutting you open. So you just think that um, for Ten Hag, this is a major problem. I mean, that if you look at that back four, James, and, and the whole team they played against, um Okay, at the weekend against uh, Bournemouth, back four was uh, a right back that Mourinho signed in Dallow. It was a centre back that Solskjaer signed, another centre back that Van Hal signed, and a left back that Spurs weren't going to register in their team. Right, a midfield of McTominay that was brought through by um, Mourinho, mm-hmm. Bruno Fernandez that was bought by Solskjaer, Amrabat who was. Um, brought in on loan um, with an, uh, 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 an escape clause, a break clause, Anthony that was signed by him, Garnacho that, that's a young kid at the academy, and Anthony Marshall that was signed by Van Hal. I mean, it is a total disgrace. Mm-hmm. So many of those players are still there. Yep. <laughs> that, by the way, throughout their entire career at United have been surrendering in games and getting away with it. Any serious football club would have got at them. Out, yeah, not there, right? Seven or eight of them would not be there. They're still at United, and you know when Ten Hag says they're not good enough to be consistent, he's correct. But um, that is a that is a really poor team. Yeah, it is, and part of the problem here is you know obviously I think we've wanted to avoid getting into. There's certainly a a little bit of a turn in the attitude towards Ten Hag from the fans this weekend from what I could tell to, you know, there's, there's always people who are calling for the manager out and things like that. I I certainly think it was quite emboldened at the weekend. I mean, in the stadium, out of the stadium, not the, not the people who remain and and all of that, but a lot of the people who left and a lot of the general thing on there. 
I think the problem that Ten Hag has now under new management is that in a lot of ways, I don't think he's going to be sacked right now or anything like that. I don't, I don't think he's particularly close. I don't think there's anyone with the appetite or the money to sack him at the moment. Or I don't anymore. think there's anyone in a position. You know, you don't even yeah. have a sack. Who's going to make, you know, Patrick Stewart's not sacking a manager. It's not happening. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's a difficult situation. Now, obviously, you have last week, which we'll talk about in a minute, Blanc and Brailsford were at Old Trafford meeting with them for David Ornstein's reports for the day. Um, and are likely going to be advising pretty regularly on a lot of what's going on, even while we're waiting. But regardless of that, I think I've mentioned before that as I kind of get it, I would consider this season to be a bit of um, like a, a job interview in a sense for Eric Ten Hag, because he's going to have to convince that he's the right man going forward, not just by default, similar to anybody who is in the position of power at Manchester United. John Murtaugh is going to have to convince why you should stick around at Manchester United uh, as Ineos come into there. All of the players are going to have to do the same thing. This is a job interview for many of them. And one of the problems I think that we have here a little bit is that I think there's probably about nine or ten players that you would say you likely need to shift out of United at the moment, at the minimum, right? Um, but that are pretty urgent. There's some you could say if they were a backup, it's okay. Like you said with Victor Lindelof, it's not a to me an urgency that Victor Lindelof has to leave, but he does have to be a backup week in and week out. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's there's a lot of players who should not be there. The problem is there's a good chunk of players who've come in under his in the last couple of years as well that do need to leave as well. Casemiro is pretty much at the end of his of his rope. Uh, Erickson is just from age wise and health wise. There's just no way he can be starting games for Manchester United. Anthony at this point is a massive failure of a signing he just is um he just is and and it's a lot of money and it's like fine you know that the recruitment has to be changed all of that but you're gonna have to start getting rid of players you just signed in it as part of this turnover no doubt about it because if you were to go into next season even totally healthy and the jury's out on mason mount um i think rasmus hoyland will come good but it's going to be time he needs time and part of the problem is you're looking at it and saying We've got to sign all the same positions you just signed players in. Not you, Ten Hag, but you, the people who are there, Ten Hag, Murtaugh, everybody responsible for this. We're going to have to come in and we're going to have to get a right winger. We're probably going to have to get another striker. We're probably going to have to get another defensive midfielder, maybe two midfielders and another center back. These are all positions that players have been brought in over the last two years. And they're going to have to redo all this work, essentially. So... I don't think at the moment the job interview is going particularly well for Ten Hag and for a lot of players uh, to, a, in terms of their future. It's a big problem for Ten Hag, James, when two of his forwards that cost around $150 million haven't yep. scored a single goal. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. Um, yeah. It's nowhere near good enough. And so when you're sitting there with an £85 million winger, and the seventy-two million pound forward, Santos striker, and I, I, as I said, I like Hoyland, but at some point he has to start scoring. Mm-hmm. You know, at some point I know you don't get a whole host of chances, but at some point you have to start scoring, right? You know, Ronaldo when he was playing Santos Leaf United was you know scored 24, 25 goals, um, and the biggest issue was he was impressing. Yeah. At some point Rasmus Hoyland has to start scoring, okay? Because this is Manchester United. This is you, you, you know. He's 20. You know, Nicholas Jackson scoring goals, you know, all his other forwards scoring goals. You, you know, I know he's only scored six, but six more than Hoyland. I know that he's done okay in the Champions League, but he, 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 at some point he has to start taking chances. And he's had decent chances. Um, his service is poor, I admit. But um, I think you have a serious problem for Ten Hag um, in getting sympathy whenever, you know, two of your three forwards are yours. And yeah. You know, Garnacho is very, very talented young player. He's only 19. He has to he has to be given time too. But uh he's he's still chipping him with goals. Yeah. Uh, 
but the the central striker situation is a major major problem yeah and you know when you're looking at a minus three goal difference by december i mean if you look at how you know how few goals united have, have scored in comparison to the rivals i mean in, in many cases they're at half the number of goals yeah. that is just unacceptable and you know for ten hag i i'm i'm you know i i support him i i like him but these are legitimate questions that if it was at any other top club, you'd be sacked. And I accept the fact that any other top club doesn't function like United, but that is not acceptable. Like, I mean, at some yeah. point, you have to start. Last season, and most of his sentences were exceptional. Ericsson, I don't have a problem getting rid of because he, you know, cost free, he was free. And, yeah, and that's that was the, the stop gap. You know, Amrabat, Regulon, all that, no problems. But that's the major sentence for me. The, 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 yeah. the Mason Mount one is a big, big, big head scratcher. And the fact that Anthony, I mean, I, I just I don't I, I I don't see any development in him. I, I he's still doing that annoying, stupid foot rollover when you know they're breaking away. Oh. Um, his final ball is terrible. Um, he gives the ball away a lot, passing the ball inside midfield. Um, you know, if you look at McCominay's goal against Chelsea, it comes from Garnacho putting the ball in yep. on the head. His first goal comes from Garnacho going to the line, pulling the ball back. But you get nothing from the right. There's no, there's no, there's, there's no, um, you know, creativity. There's no goal threat. He's not crossing the ball. He's not creating. I mean, I, my, my, my thought was once you need to get a central striker, his assists will go up. But actually, they they haven't, and we're still sitting waiting on him a year and a half in, saying at some point he's going to find the form that you need to, you know, shows why you need to pay for him. And I, uh, I don't know. Are we, are we sitting in? I don't know part? that it's a form issue, is it? It just well, I, unfortunately, it seems like a. It's just he's limited. You know, you, you take the, the last game and 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 the Chelsea game and quite a few games. The thing you mentioned specifically, he'll be on the break on the right. He could get down to the line and put a ball in with his right foot. I don't think he can. He won't touch so the he ball. So he stops and ball rolls it. Ball rolls it. Lets the defense catch up. Runs into traffic. Puts it into a busy area, and that's it. And you just like. It's like a hope and a prayer that you're going to get a lucky bouncer and something out of it, and it's not coming. And yeah. in, in every game, there's three, four, five times he could drive it to the line, put it on his right foot, and not only would that help in those instances, but it would, of course, make him less predictable for the defense too because they know exactly what he's doing every time to where they don't even really have to defend him anymore, like you were saying with the goalkeeper. Even the penalty against Chelsea, if not, you know, it's – See result of him cutting inside yeah. on his left foot and going for the same shot every single time. I'm like, this is this is unbelievable to me that this is professional footballer. I don't want to say a one trick pony, but I've never seen him score a goal any other way. I've never seen him. Every single goal has been the same goal. Every single one. I mean, I think about the one at City. I think about the one at Arsenal. And I think about the one against Barcelona. Uh, think about the one I think he scored against Forest, and they I'm um, going, they're all the same goal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and anytime the ball's fallen on his right foot, I've seen him straight through on goal, missed chances because he just is not confident. I, I lots of footballers are one one footed players, but to me with Anthony, um they always know I know he's playing on the right wing, so it's conducive to cutting inside, but to me, I'm I I'm really out of patience with this because yep. every, you need a body need someone that can contribute the body needs someone that can tip him a goal the body needs someone that's going to create and even someone less talented that says you know what i'm just going to get the ball down and going to put the ball in early yeah I'm not trying well we saw it with palestri he's not the answer mm -hmm. but he came on a couple of times and made some impacts and in, in a few games just doing that just doing that, it, the bare minimum of running in there and, and, and getting in. He missed plenty of chances, too, in the last few games. But um, he, he's not the answer. But he even he was able to create some goals just by doing what you said, getting down to the line and putting it in. If you're a central it. striker, you need two things. You need wingers to put the ball in, and you need fullbacks to put the ball in. Yeah. So, you know, if you look at what United have been playing with at fullback, you know, it constantly changes. One week it's Luke Shaw, one week it's you know it, it's yeah, regular on yeah. um maybe it's Amrabat, and then you've got Dallo and Wan Bissaka on the right, neither of whom are particularly good at going forward and putting the ball in the box. You're going you, they can't cut you up and down the middle because 
their midfielders poor. Where, where's the creativity coming from for someone like Hoyland to score goals for any central striker? Yep. I mean, I just feel that. I mean, I, I've no doubt that if Hoyland was playing for Liverpool or City or something, he'd be sitting on six, seven goals too. No doubt. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But the fact is, is that I get so frustrated at United watching them every week because even when they do manage to put the ball in a box, they wait way too long and it either hits the first defender, right? Yep. Or it's nowhere near its target. You know, you know th- th- this, this is really frustrating because where does the goals come from? You know, and it's just that's something that Ten Hag has to take responsibility for. That's something I would expect a year and a half in his teams to be able to find a way to beat you more than one way. And United have many yeah. ways they can lose, but United don't have a lot of ways they can win. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the you know patterns of of chance creation, things where you say, okay, we know we can do these things to score goals, and uh, you know in it's got to come from somewhere. And, uh, I, you know, I think Ahmad Diallo is going to get a chance on the right side when he's back in a couple of weeks. I'm not saying that it's like the right answer because now you're relying on a kid who's really never played for United. He had a real good season on loan last year, but, uh, you know, at, at, uh, you know, and he's, he's, if that's that's what you're relying on because you're not getting output from anywhere else, but it still can't even really be individual there's got to be more ways to create, and, and that is a that is an issue to solve. And it's not going to get any easier, of course, because Bayern Munich tomorrow. Before we move on, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. What did you make of Bruno Fernandez's yellow card? <laughs> I tweeted, and I don't actually usually criticize uh, Bruno's attitude and energy too much. Um, I get some of the things on the body language and the whinging and stuff, but some of the best players have been a bit whiny on the pitch in, in general in terms of how they do things as long as he's putting the effort in. The yellow card, though, I, I tweeted a guy jumping off a ship, <laughs> and that's how it felt to me at the time. I felt like he was jumping ship, to be quite honest, on the moment. I think he knows what's going on there. I'm not saying he's trying to get suspended for a game, okay? I'm not trying to give that allegation or anything like that at all. I think that would be unfair um, to make that ac- an accusation like that. But I think if I think he'd be a lot more cognizant of the moment if he was really, really wanted to lead the team into Anfield and show something. And uh, and so it's very disappointing to me. I think that is really disappointing. I think for me, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that what he did is entirely in character for Bruno Fernandes because I've seen him do it so many other times before and probably yeah. Anfield wasn't even on his mind at that point. Yeah, think you're probably really, right. That that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be. Maybe it yeah. doesn't mean that he shouldn't be sitting there thinking, but, you know what, let's make sure uh, whatever happens, yeah. this game is gone, I'm available for next week because we need to yeah. respond. That's where you have to be intelligent. Like, um, So, um, you know, to me... He, he was obviously frustrated, I'm sure, with himself because he was poor too. But I think that that really is where you know, Fernandez should be a bit smarter and making sure he doesn't get a yellow card. I mean, that that he, he, he's not the only one. Never, never um, been so dread in the game at Anfield. I know, in, I know. My entire life watching this football club. And I just, I fear, James, that. Um, yeah. That is a that is a it feels like when Mourinho went there, mm. and United lost comfortably, and that was the end. And I just feel that a number of those players have already accepted it's okay to lose there, and they know we're not going to take responsibility because they don't take responsibility for any of this, right? No matter what they say in public, they always have someone else to blame and say United. And I really worry about United going there because this team has shown time and time again that they're okay with losing and they're okay with losing badly and they're okay with having their integrity quest and they're okay with all of that. And um, I, I have no confidence that they're going to go ahead and put a decent performance in, even against a Bayern, because as soon as they go a goal behind, you just see the whole attitude just goes, well, it's not my fault, it's yeah. his fault, it's his fault, it's his fault. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big... Um, it's a big, big concern. Um, sorry, so you uh, switch your attention to Bayern and uh, what we call with Liverpool for the weekend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, the Bayern game 
it has obviously it's potentially a meaningless game in a lot of ways anyway. Not that they should know that or would know that while playing because it's a dependent even if they win on the result in the other game ending in a draw for United to qualify for the next Champions League round, um, which unfortunately I feel is rather unlikely uh, if they beat Bayern in the first place. They obviously are capable of scoring goals against Bayern. They did so before. Um, but I think that this ties into Bayern. This ties into to, to Anfield at the weekend. I think the approach to both should be the same. The focus, I think, really, really has to come from Ten Hag on locking things down a bit. I, I really think they just, if there's ever a time to be a bit pragmatic and say, it, it's got to be this. These have to be these moments because, let, let me put it this way too. I think, you know, it's not giving necessarily the benefit of the doubt, but I do think that a lot of athletes mentally aren't that strong. I mean, if you look at the, the reality of it, I'm not saying they aren't because a lot of them work really hard, but at the same time, you have you have a bunch of, of young people and it's very easy to get shaken confidence-wise and lose complete belief in everything. It's very easy to do it, especially when you're lacking in, in a lot of leadership in the in the area. Um, one of the things that, that Solskjaer did really well uh, at times was, you know, there there was a, a game, set his second season, right, uh, second full season, but they lost 6-1 to Tottenham before the international break. was a was a ter- one of the worst games I've ever seen them put in, right? Um, they lost 6-1 to Tottenham. And right after that game, um, they after the international break, they came back and they played really solid, really solid, and I mean compact defensively, I mean quite literally compact defensively they just essentially circled the wagons and said okay we're just going to make it difficult to score and we got to focus on something we can do well make it really difficult to score and they built upon that throughout the season and it ended up being quite a good season and I think that um, there was a I remember at the time reading about it where he probably learned it from as well was there was the the loss from uh, with it was in a during a title season that uh, United under under Sir Alex lost was a 6-0 something made something huge right against uh, City or somebody like that in in there. They lost uh, six one at home to City. Yeah, and they talked about there's a, there's an interview or there's some articles or talk about it from some of the players where he talked about just from that point focusing on getting clean sheets to clean things back up to get back in into the swing of things and, and you don't usually lose six one in a season where you win a title. That's not a normal thing to do, right? Um, but he did. Solskjaer got second that year. And I think that this is the only way for United to go forward is to focus on trying to do something you can control. But not only that, doing that takes maximum effort. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of caring. And if you cannot do that, then there's no point trying to do anything else. So that would be my focus and my hope. Here's is- the thing. I know you want to play expansive football and all of that, but you know, well, that and hatches a little bit and, and not saying you're not going for a win, but you're going for it by, by being robust defensively and knowing you do have the quality to score against another team individually as well. In in his slate defense, one week he's being criticized for not being possible. So I'll yeah, playing yeah, track. Oh, just do it, mate. You know, just go yeah. on the front foot and then like someone, you know, there's, there's a long for both. I remember um, when Ericsson was asked earlier in the season about why United kept conceding after they scored. And he said, um, concentration, focus. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so in order to defend properly with discipline, you have to stay focused. You have mm-hmm. to be well organized. and You have to be determined to get a result. Players, attacking players don't want to defend. Okay, They hate defending. Okay, um, and it shows in how they defend. Like it's it goes against their instinct. They don't want to spend any energy defending. Okay, so you have to have a really defensive lineup to pick. The problem is if it goes wrong, you'll get slaughtered because you came to yeah. lose. The game, in my opinion, um, you know. So in Ten Hag, does he lose having a go, or does he lose trying to keep the score down? Because to me, if you go to Anfield a year and a half into a rain just to keep the score, then that's a really bad look. Might mm-hmm. be the pragmatic thing to do, given where United are at. But yep. 
I'm looking at United team going, would I trust that United team defender at Anfield for 90 minutes? To, to I mean, I, I, I would say that if they do that, which, you know, they may do it anyway, um, they're going to concede really early with something stupid, right? With, with giving the ball away in a stupid area, with not concentrating on a corner, not concentrating on a free kick, something really stupid because United give goals away that nobody else gives away. And they've been doing, I mean, the, the perfect example is a weekend. Look at even the fourth goal, right? Which yeah. is just yeah. unbelievable. Look at the goals against Galatasaray. Look at, the, I mean, yep. any game this season, we need to consider goals, Copenhagen, Bayern Munich. They're, they defy belief that they happen at the professional level. There's just so many things wrong. Look at the goals they consider at home to yep. break. I mean, unbelievable. It yeah. just, it, it, it def- I remember Basix a year away. How did Genetic you know concede those goals? I remember Leipzig away. How did Genetic you know concede? I mean, it just was, was on and mm-hmm. on. With Solsko, the Spurs came so many goals where you're like, this just defies belief. I mean, you know, yeah. had a 5 0 at home, lost 5 0 at home to Liverpool under Solsko, then lost against the city. They just lost against Leicester in the FA Cup before that. Yeah. You know, it's, this is a consequence of players not doing the basics, not doing yeah. the most well, it, basic things. And, and that's why I recommend it. Not because, like, if there were two games, I would not blame. Ten Hag for sticking 11 men behind the ball would be right now. Simply because, frankly, I feel that if there's any hope for the rest of the season, he's got to get them to do the basics and insist upon it first because you yeah. can't build on on anything else. And so, because I, I, I'm the same way, you know, last season I had hoped we'd play more expansive football for most of the year because it was his first season and say it's a free hit. That was my view on last season. I know that wasn't for a lot of people, and that's part of the problem at United as well, is that it should have been, if you're really committing to it, you should have said, look, your first season is essentially a free hit. Play expansive football, play your way, and build upon it. In your second season, yeah, now you do have that exact problem, that exact dilemma. Can you go back to playing basic defensive football on the counter without getting criticized? Well, you're going to lose your job the other way, you know, because we can't do the basics, right? We cannot defend in transition. And I would say that I I feel that there's a path forward if you can just if you would just insist on the basics because if they're not going to do that anyway, they're not going to win playing the other way. If they can't do the basics, they're not going to win playing the other way. It's not going to happen. They're going to fluke some results, but they're going to keep losing, and and you're not really going to gain anything out of it. And that that's all I'm saying is is I that's why for me in this in this case, honestly, against Anfield, they put 11 behind the ball, Marcus Rashford up top and said, we're just going to send him, you know, running at the defense every time we win it back. So be it, honestly. Let's do the basics and defend well and show me you can do that or not. And they can't though. Uh, I know, but they have to. Then but, it's pointless. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm just saying it's, but, it, there's no point if they can't do the basics. And then for me, though, this is where responsibility falls on the players. Because if yeah. Ten Hag was sacked on Friday and another yeah. manager took in at the Anfield, should be enough common sense amongst that team to be able to play with discipline. I mean, they've been playing football their whole lives. They play for yeah. different yeah. monitors. They know how to hold yeah. shape. They know how to sense of danger. They know how to do the basics that will keep you competitive in a game of football. That's all you have to do is stay competitive. I mean, you look yeah. at the way Fulham played against Liverpool. United will be nowhere near that, right? That Not that they don't have the ability, but they just the players don't really have the desire, right? They mm. don't really care. And when you're looking at players giving you know goals away that defy, but I mean, like I said, the fourth goal is just, um, and, and you know, got lucky that they didn't count. The the second goal where Dallow just stands and watches the guy cross yeah, the ball. Know. You know, the, the first goal where the ball's clipped inside, knocked down the line, pulled back, so like he still mails, you know, a mark, puts a ball. You're like, this is a disgrace. This is absolutely, yeah. I don't care who your manager is, okay. When you're a professional football and you walk onto that football pitch, yep. I expect you to know enough, to have enough um, experience and game knowledge to know what positions to occupy. I mean, the, the the third goal, going there's no one knows the, the, the zonal marking. Is it Myanmar? Is it? There's no organization. There's no one in the back going, okay, this is what we do. Okay. And the, I mean, to me, 
you know, criticize Ten Hag deserves that. Mourinho tried to play pragmatic football and hold Rashford and his wingers really deep, yeah. right? Because yeah. he didn't he didn't trust them to get back, and the players hated it, right? Um, then they get set free under Solskjaer, and then they didn't like him because he was too nice. And so to me, it's like it's not that um, they they just don't have the desire to win, to go to Anfield and be disciplined. And 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 to to them, it's like they've because they've already, you know, they've already um, they've already found a way to to be comfortable with the fact that it's not their fault they're losing. Because I guarantee you, that there's at least five or six of those players in that team that don't think it's their fault that United are losing. They think it's somebody else's fault, and yeah. it shows in everything that they do. So there'll be players taking the field at Liverpool next weekend. Although if we lose today, it's not my fault. Okay. Yeah. It's his fault. It's their fault. It's the trainer's fault. It's it, it's the it's it's the it's 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 Ten Hag's fault. It's it's the training. It's the Hammer Harbor running. It's the fact that he's not nice. It's the fact that he all the, the, all of that, right? And why not? Because they've been doing it for years and they've got away with it for years. I mean, I just we just read out how many of these players that started the game against Bournemouth transcend managers of the last ten years. Yep. So why wouldn't they do it again? Yeah, well, agreed. And and uh, so I guess uh, we'll see. Unfortunately, though, it, it doesn't spell well either way for anybody yeah. involved. I mean, that's kind of where it is. You know, we can't – I don't think Ten Hag can survive another 7-0 or worse. I don't think he well, can. Well, I mean, I, I would, I would, I, if I, would, I would actually appreciate more if that happened if he resigned. Um, I don't think Ten will know to sack him. But to me, if yeah, I agree, I'd probably agreed. say – like if I can get you to do the basics, I'm wasting my time here, and I'm yep. and, I, and I'm go. And in that situation, the players would be under enormous pressure. Now yep. the fans, because if Tim Hag gets sacked, they can say, "Well, it was his fault." But if he resigns and and and, and says, yeah. "I can get you to 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 give a hundred percent." The players will have nowhere to hide, and I would appreciate that, but we will see. All right, man, thanks for doing this as always. Thanks to all of you yeah. folks for downloads, retweets, everything else. I will be back next week, and God knows what will happen in the next <laughs> seven days. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, hopefully, um, you need to have got two decent results. I'm not holding my breath, but we'll see. All right, take it easy, man. Cheers, see you later. Cheers. See you, bye.